The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. On June 22nd of 2022, the Government of Canada introduced its single-use plastics prohibition regulations, legislation that states plastic checkout grocery bags are considered single-use if the bag breaks or tears if used to carry 10 kilograms over a distance of 53 meters 100 times. A plastic straw is considered single-use if after washing it 100 times in the dishwasher, it changes shape. Does that make the straw a bad environmental choice? A paper straw that may, may survive a single use is not considered a bad environmental choice. Plastic knives and forks are treated the same way. If after 100 washes, it changes shape, then it's considered single use and a bad choice. The day before recording this interview, these two catalogs arrived in my mail unsolicited and unneeded. They won't be used not even once. Is that a bad environmental choice? When it comes to single use, we might be better off focusing on paper rather than plastic, says leading plastic scientist Chris Diarmet. He's the author of Phantom Plastics, a book that debunks the prevailing thoughts about plastics. He points to the Bank of Canada, which studied plastic versus paper for the country's money, and the decision was to print plastic money rather than paper because it was the better environmental choice. Heresy, you say. How can that be? Diarmet claims life cycle analysis is the answer. Plastic money has seven times the lifespan of paper money. When looking at the total impact of paper money, the carbon footprint and environmental cost far exceeds that of plastic. Diarmet starts by pointing to the weight of the paper, saying the extra fuel required to transport paper over plastic is just one element in the life cycle analysis of money. And then add in the impact of harvesting trees, mashing them into pulp and paper, and the limited lifespan, and it all adds up to plastic being the best choice. Diarmet continues, litter is created by people who can stop doing that by banking better choices. When you attach value to plastic, it does not clog drains or end up in the sewer. The proof of that is in the money. There are more than 8 billion plastic banknotes printed each year, and they do not get discarded. I invited Dr. Chris Diarmet to join me for a conversation that matters about plastics, the myths and misconceptions. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Stu. Thanks for inviting me back. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the public. So great to see you. <clears throat> Since we first talked, I have been sharing information about your work and research. And one question that always comes back to me, yeah, but when you put that plastic bag into a, uh, uh, you know, a garbage facility, it doesn't decompose. Is, right. are, are people correct when they make that statement? No, they're not correct about it. Um, plastics degrade more quickly than almost any other material we use. They degrade more quickly than concrete, than clay, than porcelain, and even, than, even more quickly than uh, paper in some cases. So paper, if you put it in your drawer, it would take over 2,000 years to degrade. And we have paper that's over 1,000 years old, so we know that that's true. So this idea that um, plastics degrade too slowly is absolute nonsense. It's not supported by the science. And the other thing is, we know from life cycle analyses that we want things to last forever. The greenest object is the thing, this pen, let's say I made this pen and it lasted forever. That would be green because I only spend the energy and the resources once to make the pen and it lasts forever. So the very idea that we want things to degrade is false. It's proven to be bad for the environment to have things degrading. And where, the, and where the drive comes from is people want Harry Potter solution, I call it, right? I can throw my trash on the floor and it will disappear in a puff of smoke by magic, right? So, and that's, that's convenient for the litterers to blame the litter and expect it to disappear into a puff of smoke. But really the responsibility is with those litterers and, uh, you know, dealing with their things responsibly like all adults should do. So what is it about a plastic bag, for instance, like this one, that makes it decompose? Because on the surface, I think, well, no, it looks like it's a pretty solid uh, structure that it will mm -hmm. survive. Um, yeah. What makes it decompose? Yeah, so basically a plastic bag is made of the same things that we are. 
uh, like proteins and enzymes and DNA and cellulose, all of those things are polymers made of carbon-carbon bonds, right? And that's exactly the same kind of chemistry that's used to make these plastics. And so they degrade at the same speed as those other things do if you left it out in the open or if you put it in the ground. So um, when it comes to bags, there's been more studies on them than anything else. There are 28 life cycle analyses on bags. And every one ever done in the whole world shows that the polyethylene bag is the greenest choice. So people who are replacing with paper or cotton are willingly and 100% certain to be increasing harm to the environment. And that includes several countries who are legislating us to go from the 100% proven greenest solution to more harmful solutions, just because they were too lazy to say, hey Siri, life cycle analysis of bags, show me what you've got, right? You could Google it, you can Siri it, and you can find, you know, you shouldn't trust Siri for your answers, but you can find the scientific studies, 28 of them, everyone showing that plastics bags are the, uh, the least harmful choice. And so this is the thing. How do we go about making the appropriate choices around plastic? Are there, so somebody could say, okay, Chris, I, I, I get what you're saying, but is there a way that we can make that plastic bag even uh, you know, a, a better environmental choice? Can it be a little sturdier? You know, in my introduction, I said, the government of Canada says that if after 100 uses, the bag tears or, or rips, uh, it's then considered single use, even though it was 100 right. uses. Could we yeah. make the bag 125 uses? And, and if so, what would be the work that would be required to do that? And what might be the benefit to people who go, good, there's a plastic bag that I can continue to reuse in many ways? Right. So I want to make one more point in the last question first, and that is if you take a plastic bag, so scientists have done this, they put a plastic bag outside just on the ground or nailed onto a fence or something, it falls to pieces and degrades in less than one year. And we're talking two peer-reviewed scientific studies to show the plastic bag disintegrates and, and vanishes it within one year. So we have people telling us, like the World Wildlife Fund tells us that they last hundreds of years. It's just fiction, it's pure fiction. The industry spends $5 billion a year on stabilizers for plastics because they're so incredibly unstable, right? So I'm a plastic scientist, and that's one of the first things you learn when you do a PhD in plastics is they say, hey, there's a whole area called stabilizers, and we need these things because plastics are going rotten, almost like an apple when you pull it out of the fridge and cut it in half. It's Some of the plastics are degrading almost that rapidly without stabilizers. So that's the, the first answer, is you have to add better and more stabilizers if you want it to last longer. The second thing is you have to use thicker plastic. And that's been done. So they've done life cycle analyses comparing single use so-called single use plastic bags, which actually get reused as trash bags, as everyone knows. But anyway, they've taken thinner bags, compared them to thicker bags. And the thicker bags can be a pretty green solution. A thick reusable plastic bag is a green solution, um, but it still loses to the so-called single use bag when you look at the life cycle analysis. And the reason is you're using so much more plastic that you have to reuse it a lot of times. And when they study the people, they find out that they're not reusing it enough times for it to actually become green. If that plastic bag were a bit thicker and really were used a hundred times, then it would be a greener solution, but that's not how people actually behave. Chris, I gotta get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. No, but if we're talking about making appropriate environmental choices, would we not be better off uh, legislating to have a slightly thicker plastic bag, or yeah, rather than a paper bag? Well, that depends on the life cycle analysis. What they do is they look at the, sing the thinner bag, the thicker bag, and then they look at what people actually do. And what they find is that that's actually worse for the environment because people are not holding onto these bags. And the other thing is they've done studies showing serious infections coming from these bags. They build up, uh, if you shop in these bags, they've got mold and fungus and E. coli and things like that. They've actually traced that to, to health issues. So now you've got to take your multi-use bag and put it through the dishwasher or somehow wash it, which means water and energy and detergent and so forth. So there, there are other elements that come in once you start reusing a bag. So in theory, things that last forever and things that are reusable are greener, but only if you actually really do reuse them. Okay, so then that brings up the topic of these heavier, uh, thicker bags. And some of them are made out of burlap and cloth and so on, that we say to uh, a consumer, bring your own bag to the grocery store. Is that a better choice? The cotton bags are horrendous for the environment. They've done studies on cotton bags and they have to be re reused hundreds of times. They have to become green. 
compared to a plastic bag. They have to be washed and they just lose every time. So they're horrendous. Even uh, biodegradable plastic bags are worse for the environment than polyethylene bags. So these studies have been done, 28 of them, and it's absolutely categorical. And it's incompetence on the part of the green groups, so-called green groups, and on the part of the government that they didn't go to Google and type in, as I did, LCA bag. Life cycle analysis bag. As I said, these are publicly available. They're peer reviewed. There's 28 studies and they could have checked the answer in 30 seconds if they had done their jobs properly. So what we're doing now is we're focusing in on plastics. We're focusing in on single use. We need to step back and say, what does the science say? What is the greenest solution when it comes to straws? And when it comes to straws, the greenest solution is don't take a straw. Any idiot can work that out. Just say no to the straw. That's the greenest solution. The second greenest solution is a plastic straw especially if it's reused. And I have reused one a hundred times and that's, that works absolutely fine. Um, but of course, people define them as single use simply because they choose to throw them away after one use. <laughs> and there you are drinking without a straw. That's right, yeah. It's amazing how that works. Most people can do that just fine. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. I, you know, I smile at that because I think that uh, w so many people feel that they are making some kind of contribution or effort when they say, oh yes, give me a paper straw versus the plastic straw. Mm -hmm. but. As you point out, the life cycle analysis of that paper straw uh, comes nowhere close to the paper paper straw. What if we were to go to uh, metal straws? And I've seen them. I've seen ceramic yeah. straws. Are they better mm -hmm. choices? No, they're all worse, and they all create more waste. They cr they need more energy, more CO two, more fossil fuels to make them because of all the energy needed, and so forth. So they all lose to the plastic straw. But the best straw. I'm not here to sell plastics. I just want people to base their opinions on things that are actually true. And I've learned a lot of new things too since last time we talked. And let me just quickly whiz through them because okay. we're so focused on plastics. People forget to talk about why do we hate plastics in the first place, right? And let me tell you why people hate plastics, because I've had tens of thousands of interactions online with people who hate plastics. And these are the reasons. So we add, we eat five grams of plastic every week, right? According to the World Wildlife Fund, we eat five grams of plastic, credit cards worth of plastic every week. What does the latest scientific study, the peer reviewed study say? It says the World Wildlife Fund study is absolutely categorically wildly wrong and it would take over 20,000 years to eat a credit card's worth of plastic. So we hate plastic for something which is patently untrue and there's peer-reviewed evidence for every single statement I make. Second thing, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the sea. That was from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It was proven to be absolute fiction and debunked and it's based on a number that there's 10 million tons of plastic going into the ocean. Right. So what is the latest scientific paper on plastic going into the ocean? It says that they made a horrendous mistake in their calculations. And the actual number is not 10 or 12 million tons. It's 6000 tons. They were wrong by a factor of more than 1000 in their calculation. And the way that they found that out is they said, whoa, there's 10 or 12 million tons going into the ocean. We've got these uh, boats going around with nets, right, pulling, looking for this plastic and we can't find it. Where the heck did it go? So they went back, they checked all the calculations, they measured the amount of plastic coming out of the rivers and they found out that the real number is 6,000 tons. So their, their actions are not meeting their motives. There's another one that, uh, as you alluded to, plastics take 450 or 500 years to degrade. And I went searching for this, um, where this came from, this myth. And here's the book that started the whole thing. If I can get it on screen. Um, can you see that? Sort of move it a little bit more. There you go. There we go. That's better, isn't it? So Environmental Hazards and Marine Pollution by Martha Gorman. And here's the page where she makes this statement. And she just says plastics take up to 500 years to decompose. There's no reference. There's no scientific citation. Of so this is another reason people hate plastics because there's too much plastics, right? We're, we're drowning in plastics. If you ask Siri, hey Siri, what is the global consumption of plastics, right? This will take you 30 seconds. And then you say, hey Siri, what's the global consumption of materials? You divide one number by the other one, multiply by 100, and what do you find out? Plastics are 0.4% of the materials we use, right? So why are we obsessing? Why are we spending billions? Yeah, 0.4% of all the materials we use are plastics. We're spending billions of dollars. We've got legislation up the wazoo. We've got people obsessing about this plastic because we're allegedly drowning in it, while we're completely ignoring 99.5% of the problem. 
right? So this is enraging to me. You would have to be clinically insane to think that you can focus on 0.5% of a problem and solve it. That would be like me cleaning my cutlery drawer and expecting the rest of the house to clean itself. I'd have to be nuts to believe that. And that's what we're doing right now. And lastly, they enrage us because they say plastics are a threat to whales, turtles, and birds, and so forth, right? So you can literally go to, to Google, as I did, right? And you can look for these scientific studies. Well, I'm not trusting Google. I'm trusting the science. And you look for whale mortality study, right? Bird mortality study. These are not studies. I'm, not, I never, I'm a proper scientist. I don't look for studies that support my view. I look impartially, three words, whale mortality study. You'll find the same studies I did, or you can find them on my website. And what you'll find is that in these studies, there's never been a single mention of the word plastic or bag. Not one mention. They've got tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of recorded deaths without one mention of the word plastic anywhere in the studies. So for example, birds in America, 500 million are killed by cats in America alone. Those are the real numbers, right? 36,000 are killed by the word, those uh, wind turbines, hardly anything. So if you really care about birds, put a bell on your cat, right? So this is the problem. I'm not worried about what people think about plastics, but I would like them to look at the evidence and make rational decisions that will actually make a difference. We cannot make a dent by focusing on half a percent of a problem. We can't make a dent on, uh, on bird or whale or, or other mortalities if we don't look at the data and see what is killing? I care, let's say I care about whales. What kills whales and what could I do about it? Let's address this logically instead of just taking the being really virtuous takes work, right? You can't just jump on a bandwagon and, as you said, you've got friends at the dinner table who think that they're super green because they're using a cotton bag. That's not the way to be virtuous. That's just copycatting. That's jumping on a bandwagon. It's being lazy and it's virtue signaling. That's trying to look good. But to actually be good is more work. And that requires a few minutes to look at the evidence and then make up your mind when you've seen it. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Okay, Chris, why do you care so much? Uh, you have no, nothing in the game here. Uh, I, right. No, I understand that you work as a plastic scientist, and, and that is the industry that you work in, but are you not jeopardizing your own career by being so vocal about plastics? Well, I'm a crusade. If you do a, have you ever done a Myers Briggs or a Big Five uh, personality study where you can tell what drives you? So it tells you whether you're creative, which is me, right? I solve people's problems for a living. And you can measure your IQ, for example, and you measure whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. And one of the things that comes out of that is that I am just somebody who's a crusader for truth. I don't care if you hate plastics or if you like plastics, but I want people to, be, to base their opinions on things that are actually true and look at the evidence. My kids were being taught lies at school by their teachers who didn't know any better, right? And that infuriated me. And that's what began this quest. So I've wasted, a present count, I've wasted tens of thousands of dollars of my own money. I've wasted 2,000 hours of my own time reading over 3,000 peer-reviewed articles because Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund and Ellen MacArthur and our governments were too lazy to do it. I seem to be the only person who cared enough to actually look at the facts. And, and ironically, I don't care that much about plastics, I said, and I don't even care that much about the environment. But I do care about people looking at solid data when they're making up their mind about things. You want people to make informed choices. Yeah. Yeah. That's not too much to ask, but it's just so much easier for people to grab a headline and run with that because that's less work. Chris, didn't anybody ever tell you that we're driven by emotional responses, not logical yes. ones? I have some books behind me from Jonathan Haidt about that. That's right. So he has a, the model with the elephant and the rider. So the, the, the elephant is, is your gut response, and that's how we actually behave. And then you have your logical mind is sitting on top. It thinks that it's driving the elephant, but it's really the other way around. Yeah, so that is a big problem, Stu. What I found is that only about, if I were to estimate, I would say about 3% of people actually care about the environment and facts, and the rest of them are just sheep who are out there virtue signaling and don't actually care. That's well, unfortunate. <clears throat> You know, Aristotle pointed to this problem when he first developed the, uh, the, uh, the first three laws of rhetoric, you know, logos, ethos, pathos, mm -hmm. and he yep. said if we can get the, the emotion out of the equation in communication, people can then make informed choices. The problem is we've never been able to remove the emotion, and it is what drives people. And so there's something about plastic that seems to make sense to people uh, that it is the demon. The, my, the yeah. challenge for me, and I'm a little bit like you, is I go, 
okay, if it is, let's make sure that what we understand is true and that when we make a decision to make a change, we're doing it from a fully informed basis. And I worry yeah. that we're jumping on the bandwagon, we're feeling really good about the choices that we're making, but right. we're in fact actually making choices that are worse for the environment. Because I think, and from you, I know you said you don't care that much about the environment, but you do. I mean, this is our home. Uh, we have to look after where we live. Uh, you don't keep your room neat for no reason at all. You care about where you live and the impact that you have. And truth is vitally important. Yeah. Well, that's the irony, Stu. There's no one doing more damage to the environment than the so-called environmental groups. Because if you look at what they say, it's all fiction. It's and even you've got like the founder of Greenpeace, as you know, Patrick Moore, you've talked to him, you've had him on the show. He said, my work is the best work he's ever seen on plastics. And I checked his work on plastics because that's not his number one area. And it's all correct. For example, he talked about Henderson Island, right? Um, one of these green groups claims that it's the most polluted island. You can literally now go with and they always make these claims in some place where you can never check it right because it's a deserted island where you, no one can get there. But these days you can actually go on Google Street View and walk up and down the beach you can do it now. There's a link on my website. You can walk up and down the beach on Henderson Island. There's nothing there. It's clean sand. And these environmental groups are telling us it's the most polluted thing ever. And they've got these staged pictures, which, you know, just to just to get our money out of our pockets. So the irony is, A, the um, the NGOs, the so-called green groups are doing more to harm the environment, in my opinion, than anybody in the world. And secondly, the people who feel that they're doing the most with their cotton bags are the people doing the most harm because they've fallen for this and they didn't check the evidence before they went on their crusade. Passion is a wonderful thing, but it has to be driven in the right direction. It's like Otherwise, it's like a missile that's a, where the homing device has gone wrong, right? You've just got this missile flying around, tons of passion. You're going with a heck of a speed, but you end up bumping into the wrong thing. Well, I run into some of the same problems that you do by having uh, guests like you talk about this. Uh, people tell me that they say that I'm not a believer and that I'm not uh, out to protect the environment, when in fact I am. Uh, and I want to try and uh, deliver messages that are much more closely associated to the truth. And yeah. uh, like you, I'm sure you get accused of being paid off by somebody. I get that uh, accusation all the time. <laughs> nobody's paying me. Uh, if, yeah. if I had the money, I would have a much better production, I, and we don't. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is that we make the right choices. Chris, I applaud the work that you're doing, and I thank you thank for you. taking the time to come in and, and have this uh, conversation with me. Let's face it, Stu, the other side's got all the money. Look at the look at the finances of some of these companies who are spreading lies, right? And they've got hundreds of millions of dollars. The side we're on is really unpopular and there's no money in it. So you'd have to be insane to pick this side of the argument, the one with the facts, if you were interested in the finances, because it just doesn't work. Well, there you go. We're insane. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a great conclusion. Thanks a lot, Stu.